Well, it's lovely to see you all. And I hope you've got your Bibles, and I'd like you to open them, please, at John's Gospel, chapter 7. It was um, great last Sunday having Roger Carswell with us. He's a bit like a human hurricane. He, he's really hard to um, control. You really just get swept along in the, the wind. Now, originally, I was meant to be preaching last Sunday, and last Sunday I was going to give an overview of John's Gospel, chapter 7, 8, 9, and the first half of chapter 10. Uh, and then this week we would be delving into John chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. And um, I know that uh, uh, just looking at John chapter 7 and the first 13 verses is a, a lot for one sermon. Um, but we've got to um, look at the whole lot this morning because I've got to keep pressing on through John's gospel because I want to get to the end of John chapter 10 by May bank holiday so that during the summer we can have a break and then go back to John 11 in uh, September. So um, I've got to keep pressing on. And um, yeah, because Roger Carswell came last week, it's kind of messed up my preaching plan. As I said, he was meant to be coming in February. So you think, well, it's easy. I just move my sermons along one week. But unfortunately, I'm going to be away in that week in February. Roger was coming when I was on holiday. So I've lost a Sunday. So I'm going to have to put one massive sermon and another normal sermon all together this morning. All right. So we've got a lot to get through this morning. But it's, it's quite helpful because the theme that we're looking at this morning is that we're not to be tied to our timetable. We've got to learn to fit in with God's timetable. So the very fact that I'm having to do this with my sermons is quite a good illustration for us all. Don't be tied into your plans. I'm going to do this and that, and then next year I'm going to do this and that. Learn to be tied into God's timetable. If God's will, I'm going to go... God's way. Now, in John chapter 7, we pick up the story in it's September AD 32, as best we can work out. Jesus' family and his friends, they are ready to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, naturally, they expected Jesus to be traveling with them and his disciples going with them because it was a good four to five day trek from uh, Capernaum down to Jerusalem. Although they would never say from Capernaum down to Jerusalem, they would always say from Capernaum up to Jerusalem because for them you're always ascended up to Jerusalem. And it was a trip of 110 miles. Now if you're walking 110 miles, it takes four or five days, and it was safest to go in groups so that the bandits uh, wouldn't be so likely to attack you. And so the villagers would all gather together and they would all go in a group down to Jerusalem. And they say to Jesus, are you coming with us? But Jesus explains in verse 8 that he is not going with the villagers. The New International Version, the version of the New International Version that we've got in verse 18 it makes Jesus say, I am not yet going to the feast. But if you look at the uh, footnotes, some and the better manuscripts say, Jesus says, I am not going to the feast. In other words, I'm not going with you. I'm not going now. It's a bit like on Saturday. You are at home you're busy, you're doing some college work or you're sorting out your finances or you're cleaning the car or whatever and the, the others say to you, look, we're going to town, do you want to come? And you say, no, I'm busy. But then three hours later, when you've finished all your work, then you go. And that's what's happening here. Jesus doesn't lie, he doesn't deceive them. Yeah, he's not there trying to tell them that he's not going to the feast, but he really is planning to go to the feast. He, he's simply working to God's timetable, not their timetable. They're all there. They're all going. They say, are you coming with us? And he says, no. But then, a few days later, after his family have left, 
Jesus went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles as well. And we need to learn to work to God's timetable. So in chapter 7 to the middle of chapter 10, they tell us what happened then when Jesus was at the Feast of Tabernacles. And we learn, the first thing we're going to learn here in overviewing the whole of chapter 7, 8, 9 and 10 up to verse 21 of chapter 10 is that Jesus mustn't be rejected. Now this is the bookends of this section. In chapter 7 verses 1 to 5, Mike read these verses to us a little while before, we find that the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. So Jesus was staying away from Judea uh, up in Galilee because they wanted to kill him. And then in the end of this section, John chapter 10 verses 19 to 21, we find the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, Jesus is mad, he's demon-possessed. And others said, no, he, if he opens the eyes of a blind man, he can't be demon-possessed. So that's the bookends. Now, if you are observant, you will realize that this section is talking about the Jewish leaders. It's not talking about the masses. When John writes about the masses of people, he calls them the crowds. When he uses the word Jews, he means the Jerusalem authorities. Now in chapter 6 that we've looked at the end of last year, at the Feast of Passover, that was six months before the Feast of Tabernacles, the teaching there in chapter 6 was about real discipleship. And you will remember that at the beginning of John chapter 6, everybody was keen about following Jesus Christ because they saw the miracles he did and they ate the bread he provided. But at the end of John chapter 6, they rejected Jesus Christ because of his teaching. You remember that? Well, here in John chapter 7 to 12, at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Jews want to kill Jesus because of his teaching, but they're confronted by his miracles, and this makes them question whether their rejection of Jesus is right. When you consider who Jesus Christ is, you must examine what he taught and what he did. He was mighty in word and deed, all right? must hold these two things together. Jesus' words are confirmed by his works. In other words, to put it simply, all right, to put it simply, how do you know that the gospel is true? How do you know that the word of God is true? And the answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. To put it in a nutshell, you know the words of God are true, the word of Christ is true, because of the work of Jesus Christ, his resurrection. This is why we meet on Sunday mornings. We meet every Sunday morning to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is an empty grave in Jerusalem. I remember as a 19-year-old living in Israel, going through a really tough time, and in Jerusalem, really struggling with everything. And so I got up and I walked to the garden too. And just sat there and soaked up the fact that it didn't matter what I felt like. It didn't matter what was happening to me. The truth was Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that changes everything. That confirms the gospel. We have many convincing proofs that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And so we know the scriptures are true. Jesus rose from the dead. There is an empty grave in Jerusalem, not because of grave robbers, but because of the grave defeater, who showed himself alive many times to many people before returning to glory and sending the Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. Jesus' word is confirmed by his work, so don't reject him. Now, chapter 7 tells us that Jesus gives living water. This is the theme of chapter 7. We'll learn more about the Feast of Tabernacles next week and how water fitted in with it all and everything. 
But the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated the way God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness during their journey from Egypt to Canaan. Passover, that we looked at in chapter 6, the Feast of Passover was celebrating how the Israelites were freed from Egypt. All right. There was the sacrifice of the lamb. And they were freed from slavery. Tabernacles, the feast of chapter 7 to 10, is how the Israelites lived during their 40 years pilgrimage through the wilderness to the promised land. And you will remember if you read the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, that God gave the people water to drink. How did God give them water to drink? There's that m remarkable story, that miraculous event, where God gave them water from the rock. You read about it in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 6. Well, the rock is a picture that points to Jesus. Jesus is the true rock. And he gives us living water to drink. Look at chapter 7, verse 37. Chapter 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. You come to Jesus Christ to drink. And what is the drink? Look at verse 30. 9, chapter 7, verse 39, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. We are not meant to be running on empty. It is exhausting living the Christian life. As the old hymn says, we're marching to Zion. And it's a long march. There are so many trials to face. There are so many battles to fight. There is so much to do. We have our own personal walk with God and our personal disciplines. We have our family responsibilities to bring up our children in the teaching and instruction of the Lord to have a godly home. There's our responsibilities at work to be a light shining in the workplace, to be a good influence there. There's the church where we have to use our gifts to encourage one another and build up the, the family of God and to sincerely love one another. And then there's the world that needs to be one for Jesus Christ. It's hard work living the Christian life and we are weak. And so Jesus Christ gives us living water to drink. He gives us his Holy Spirit to refresh us and empower us. And you can come to Jesus Christ and drink this living water. You are not expected to run on empty. You're not expected to do this in your own strength. And you don't run off to a conference that's got the magic answer. Conferences can be very good, but don't be following the latest fads, thinking that they will satisfy your thirst and empower you. Run to Jesus Christ. He is the rock. And he gives us living water to drink, to refresh us and sustain us as we walk to glory. Indeed, to revive us. It's going to be exciting as we look at these verses in coming weeks. But I saw an illustration of this yesterday when I went to the gym. I need to go to the gym for lots of reasons. And I go to the gym and I do the same thing every day for half an hour and then I stagger home. But yesterday, I went to the gym and I got on the treadmill and I was halfway through what I normally did and I couldn't go on any longer. I was just so tired. I don't know why, I hadn't slept well, but I had lots of caffeine. Maybe the caffeine had dropped and I was running. And I thought, I can't do this. I can't do this. I... So I stopped halfway through. I went to the water dispenser and I gulped down a glass of water and then another one. And I was shaking, and I went back to the treadmill. I got on it, I started to run again. And the energy came back, and I could run. And I ended up faster than I did before. All I needed was some water. 
And how many of us are struggling through the Christian life, almost giving up? And what we need is to come to Jesus Christ and drink of the Holy Spirit who he pours into our lives. That's John chapter 7. John chapter 8, Jesus gives us the light of life. Well, it's John chapter 8, verse 12 to 59. Now, I'm finding it hard to know exactly when this section ends. I end it at chapter 8, verse 59. Chapter 8, verse 12 begins with Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. And so I wondered if chapter 9, verse 5 could end this section because Jesus says then, I am the light of the world. And we would have clear bookends. But chapter 9, verse 5 does seem to be in the middle of a story that begins the next section. So pray for me as I continue to study these chapters that the Lord would give me all all the insight needed. But for the moment, I have chapter 8 as a complete unit. I don't have time to explain this morning why we're ignoring the first 11 verses of chapter 8. I'll explain that when we get there. But in chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light. And then in chapter 8, verse 58, he says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the I am. He is Jehovah. He is Yahweh. He is Lord in capital letters. Not only does he give us the Holy Spirit, but he is fully God himself. He is the great I am. And so I am ending this section at the end of chapter 8. And I think this is helpful. It's certainly logical because chapters 7 and 8 are Jesus in the temple and chapters eight, sorry, chapters 9 and 10 are Jesus outside the temple in the city of Jerusalem. But here in chapter 8, verses 12 to 59, Jesus gives us light. Jesus is the light of the world. Remember, it's a time of tabernacles. Remember the story of the Hebrew slaves going through the wilderness. And God gave the Israelites light to follow. He gave them a pillar of cloud by day. And he gave them a pillar of fire by night to guide them so that they didn't get lost. So that they went the right way and made their way safely to the promised land. And Jesus is the light we follow. He hasn't given us a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. He's given us himself. God himself has become man and is the light that we are to follow. He not only gives us the Holy Spirit to drink, to empower us, he gives us himself as the light so that we can see clearly. Christianity is not just a powerful experience. We do receive the Holy Spirit. We do have spiritual life. And sometimes our experiences are incredibly powerful. And we thank God for these experiences. But your Christianity must be more than just your experience of the touch of God upon your life. You must not only experience the power of God, but you must see Clearly, as chapter 8, verse 32 says, you must know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is why we talk today about word and spirit. We need the living water, the Holy Spirit to refresh our lives, and we need the living truth, the light of God as the revelation for us to follow. The Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path because it reveals Jesus Christ. It is possible for you to study the Bible, memorize the Bible, know the story of the Bible and still be in darkness. As the Jewish leaders did that Jesus spoke to. We need Jesus to open our eyes to see Jesus in the scriptures. It works like this very quickly. Number one, Jesus is the light. Number two, when we trust in Jesus Christ, the light shines into our lives. Number three, this enables us to see Jesus in the whole Bible. So now the Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. This is why, as Christians, we must be devoted to studying the Bible. 
The Bible comes to us a bit like a miner's hat, you know, it's a light shining in the dark place. It shows us the way to go. Fourthly, the Bible then becomes like a pair of glasses for us to see not only the way we go, but the world we live in clearly. At Terry Hamblin's Thanksgiving service on Tuesday, I was due to announce the last hymn, and I didn't have my glasses on. So I looked at the order of service, and it was a bit blurred, but I could just make out in the first line of the last hymn the word glory. And so I got up and started to announce, Thine be the glory. When I put my glasses on, and I saw clearly that the hymn was, To God be the glory. (laughs) I didn't see clearly until I put my glasses on. And we can't see clearly the darkness uh, of this world around us until we can, as it were, put the scriptures that point us to Jesus Christ uh, in our minds. The Bible, when we see it revealing Jesus, enables us to see this world clearly, to see the hollowness of materialism, the hollowness of atheism, the hollowness of hedonism and postmodernism and all, all these other things. And the truth, the light, sets us free. And then, fifthly, we then become light in this world. You know the child's toy, a glow toy, has this little plasticky thing, and you hold it up to the light, and it absorbs the light, and then you take it into a dark room, and it glows. Well, that's what we are like. When we know Jesus Christ, when we love Jesus Christ, when we trust and follow Jesus Christ, and we're in the light. So that causes us to be light in this dark world. We begin to shine with his light. So don't say, I have the Holy Spirit, the living water, so I don't need the scriptures, the living truth. That's the mistake that people like the Quakers made in history. We need both, and Jesus gives us both, and the ability to receive both. And the other, on the other hand, don't say, I have the light of life, I see Jesus in the word, I don't need the living water, I don't need the refreshing uh, inflow of the Holy Spirit. We need both. As we walk through this wilderness to glory, we no- need both refreshment and revelation. Jesus gives us both. This is why it is vital that we're at the prayer meeting this Thursday. And if we can't get to the prayer meeting, it's vital that we are devoted to prayer. Because it's not enough just to be simply proclaiming the truth to the people. We need the power of God upon it as well. We need to proclaim the truth to them And we need God's spirit to unlock their hearts to receive the truth. So chapter 7, Jesus gives living water. Chapter 8, Jesus gives the light of life. And then chapters 9 and 10, Jesus shepherds us. Now we have the wonderful story in chapter 9 of Jesus giving sight to the man born blind. And it is written in such a funny way. It is hilarious. It's clearly about the funniest story in the whole Bible, but it teaches us about the opposition, not only to Jesus, but to those whom Jesus enables to see. And Jesus explains at the end of chapter 9 that the Jewish authorities are blind. They are guilty. They are bad shepherds who don't really care for the sheep. They only care for themselves. But not Jesus. In chapter 10, Jesus tells us that he is the good shepherd. As Moses led the Israelites through the wilderness to the promised land and then was replaced by uh, Joshua so the people wouldn't be like sheep without a shepherd who led them into the promised land. So just as Moses was the shepherd in the wilderness day, So Jesus leads us to glory. He is the good shepherd. And he does everything to get us there safely. He will even sacrifice his life for the sheep. That's what chapter 10 verse 11 says. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
We are weak. We are walking through this wilderness. How on earth are we going to get safely into the kingdom of God? Because Jesus Christ gives us living water that refreshes and empowers us. Because Jesus Christ gives us the light of life to give us understanding and to know the way. And because Jesus is the good shepherd who gives us protection, who will do everything necessary, even sacrificing his life to bring us to glory. And we will get there because of Jesus. Do you understand that? The Feast of Tabernacles should tell us about Jesus. He is, he is the uh, live, rock that gives living water. He is the light that shines in the way. He is the shepherd who keeps us safe. And the Jews celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, but that was just a picture. The reality is Christ. Don't reject Jesus. Do you remember that old hymn? O Christ, in thee my soul hath found, and found in thee alone. The peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. Now, none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee. What keeps us going? In Jesus, there's living water. In Jesus, there's the light of life. In Jesus, he's the good shepherd. No wonder we shouldn't reject him. We hold on to him. We trust in him. We worship him. We fall at his feet and we give our lives to him and say, Lord, lead me. We sang, lead us through this wilderness. That's just what these chapters are all about. But let's quickly go back to chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. And look at this section that introduces the Feast of Tabernacles. There's three scenes in John chapter 7. There's the verses 1 to 13, which is before the Feast of Tabernacle. Verse 14 is halfway through the feast. And verse 37 is on the last and greatest day of the feast. And chapter 7 begins. And chapter 8 ends with Jesus hiding himself from the Jews. It's an incredible picture. It's an incredible picture because in the days of the Exodus, it was Moses who was hidden from the Egyptians so that he could lead the people safely. But now, things have gone so wrong that it is Jesus who has to hide from the Jews. Now, have you ever thought about Jesus having to hide himself from people. Have you ever thought about that? Why did Jesus hide himself from people? Why didn't he just call down, you know, angels from heaven to destroy them? Thunderbolts to burn them up? The ground to open up and devour them? Why was Jesus hiding from people? We sometimes so emphasize divine sovereignty that we reject human responsibility. We say the phrase like, I am immortal until my time is come. And hallelujah, that is true. But it doesn't mean you lie down in front of steamrollers, does it? It doesn't mean you eat poisonous mushrooms or you go um, skydiving and don't wear a parachute or you don't look both ways before you cross the road. No, we, we know that God is sovereign. But we realize that we also have responsibility. Now, some Christians are so lazy and so unbiblical that they, they talk about the future. Oh, God will provide. I have no responsibilities there. They, they think about the bringing up of their children and, and the right protection and care for their children. Oh, God will look after them. They talk about their ministry. Oh, God will sort it out. They talk about evangelism and prayer. Oh, God's sovereign. His will will be done. He'll sort it. And we have fatalism. Now, thank God that he is absolutely sovereign, but remember, you are fully responsible. Even Jesus went into hiding. Don't shirk your responsibilities. What should you be doing? What are you avoiding? What are you ignoring? Because you, you, you hide behind the fact, oh, God is sovereign, and so you forget your responsibilities. How many of us parents are not praying for our children because we hide behind election? 
and we don't take intercession seriously. How many of us are not witnessing at the workplace or witnessing to our neighbours because we say, oh, well, God is sovereign. He can do it any way he wants. Don't be fatalistic. Yes, pray about things. Yes, trust God about things. But also do all that you can about it too. Even Jesus hid himself. Now, these 13 verses in John 7 are neatly written as we would expect from John, as we've seen as we've gone through the first six chapters. It's got this, what's called a chiastic outline. It begins and ends with fear of the Jews, then either before and uh, between these sections is about Jesus' brothers. They say, go up publicly, and then Jesus says he goes up not publicly. And then in the middle, verses 6 and 9, we have this section about Jesus' time, or God's Timing, And it's just this middle section that I want to draw attention to. And again, it's written very neatly. Um, verse 6a is not yet Jesus' time. And then the end of uh, verse 8, it's not yet Jesus' time. Between that, Jesus' brothers, well, they can go any time they like. And in the middle, the reason the world hates Jesus is because he exposes that their deeds are evil. But what I want you to notice here is that Jesus was concerned to follow God's timetable. He said to his brothers, any time is right for you, but I don't live by that timetable. There was a time for Jesus to go to Jerusalem and be arrested, crucified, die and rise again. But that wasn't now, that would be next spring in six months time. Jesus didn't follow the crowd or his brothers. He wouldn't do it his own thing. Jesus was determined to follow God's timetable. And you will learn that you cannot control God. You cannot control Christ and force God to do things according to your timetable. You will have to learn to follow God's timetable. You see, we want God to work to our timetable. How many times have you prayed, give me a job now, or save my children now, or solve my problems now, or give me a girlfriend now, or take me to glory now, or strike my boss with a thunderbolt now, or, or, or re resolve all my problems now. You know, God, you've got to do it now. Or if not now, we say things like, uh, we still got our own timetable. Lord, may my business be thriving in two years' time. Or may I get promotion next year. Or may I see all my grandchildren saved in the next five years. We have our timetable. But we need to follow God's timetable. And so Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Joseph spent 15 years in prison. Lazarus was left in the grave for four days before Jesus got there. So don't grumble or complain that God isn't doing things to your timetable. Don't try to control him. Submit to him. Now I don't know why Roger Carswell had to come last week and couldn't come next month. I don't know why it messed up all my plans. Maybe it was so that you heard him last week. Or maybe it's so that you hear me today. Or maybe it's so that someone else will hear Roger next month. I don't know, but God knows. And we just submit to God's perfect timing. Now, this tests our faith. And this strengthens our faith. And this causes God's will to be done. Because we're not fighting against God saying, my will be done. This glorifies God. So let us learn to trust in God. That's what the book of Ruth is about. God's timing. The book of Esther is about this. Read the stories of Helen Rosevere or Corrie Ten Boone and see how God's incredible timing is perfect. Or remember the testimony of Terry Hamlin, who many years ago, as a doctor realizing that he couldn't solve people's problems, couldn't even solve his own problems, and Bill Bates goes into the surgery and says, I'm a born-again Christian, are you? You should come to Lansdowne and hear a message that will change your life. Well, he ignores him for three months. And then three months later, Diane says, you need to go to church. So he sets off to come to Lansdowne. 
the brain the size of a planet, knows everything there is to know about almost everything, and he can't find Lansdowne Baptist Church. He sets off on Sunday morning and he can't find it, and so he doesn't come to church. So he goes home, and that week, during the week, he finds out where Lansdowne Baptist Church is, so he comes the next Sunday. And he comes in and he sits down in the congregation and he looks round to see Bill Bates who invited him three months ago to come to church. And he can see Bill Bates' wife but he can't see Bill Bates. He looks round and can't see him. And then in the middle of the sermon he realises that Bill Bates has died in the week and this is a thanksgiving service for his life. The time he has come is for Bill Bates' thanksgiving service. And then Francis Dixon points straight to him and says, do you believe? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's timing is perfect. Jesus is the saviour. He's the king. He's the Lord. Isn't he the saviour you want for your life? Who gives you living water, living light. He's the good shepherd. His timing is perfect. Isn't he the one you want to follow, to trust in, to worship? Aren't you privileged that you are the sheep and he's the shepherd? Isn't this the message that we need to proclaim? Jesus is Lord. We're marching to Zion. We're walking through this wilderness and he's in control. So let's not be discouraged. Let's be strong because he is the shepherd who keeps us safe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these chapters of John's Gospel. And as we look through them over the next three or four months, we pray that our lives would be incredibly impacted, renewed, revived, and transformed by them. That we would not only know about the living water, but we might drink deeply from the wells of salvation. That we might not only learn about the light of life, but we might see clearly through the fog of this world. And that we might not only know that Jesus is the good shepherd who even lays down his life for the sheep, but we might know him as our own shepherd. And we pray that we would not be those who fight against you, but we would be those who submit to you. You are the Lord. We are the sheep of your pasture. Your will be done. And may we as a church take our responsibilities seriously. And may we be strong and bold and vibrant in these days. For Jesus' sake. Amen.